Um, where do we go next? All right, so we looked at setting up the channel for everything except for the last setting recording. We're going to come to that. And yeah, that was a good time as any to jump into that. So let's go back to my YouTube and Twitch show. The last tab on here is recording. This will record, not internally, but to that, where were we, to that SD card right here. So records to this SD card. You obviously put whatever card you want in there. Um, to that SD card, it will record your show. And you have a variety of setups in here. You can change, you can say your time limit if you want smaller files, or I can say I don't care how big the file is. You know, we can go for an unlimited time uh, file, file size. Um, I, or unlimited time, sorry, unlimited duration. Um, and then a file size limit, I can go up to eight gig. I think that's, well, obviously it's gonna depend on your card size as well, but I mean, you know, I think I have mine set all the way up and just leave it all the way there. And then file type, do you want MP4 files, movie files, um, AVIs, do you want segmented uh, MP4 fragmented files, MPEG files? You can get whatever you want out of it. So we're just gonna leave it at MP4. I can name it if I want to. I can say, you know, let's call this photo Joseph show like so. And so every file is gonna have that name on there. And I click apply. And now, whenever I'm recording, I'm going to be recording this show, this channel, YouTube and Twitch. This channel is going to get recorded to that file. If I go back into the settings in here, you'll see that I have a few options. I have single touch control, which is currently enabled. So now I have, I'm going to explain that in a moment. I have this YouTube channel is set up for single touch. The Facebook mirror is probably set up for single touch as well because that's the default. Let's see here. Um, oops, wrong one. I didn't mean to go to new channel. Sorry. Status and delete, do not want that. Let's go back into the Facebook mirror and um, is it encoding streaming. Streaming is one of the streaming settings. Oh, I haven't yet set this up yet. If I set this up, it would have a uh, single touch control enabled on that. So I haven't set up the mirror yet on here. So that one's not there. Okay, so I have one streaming setup on single touch and one recording on single touch. If I go back to this interface, You'll see I have start. I must have other ones set up already that I, I haven't deleted from earlier. Anyway, according to this, I have three recordings ready to go and two streamings ready to go. If I hit start, that is going to simultaneously start all of these. It's going to start streaming to both channels and recording all three channels simultaneously. This is fantastic. So I can do everything from here with a single touch. Once it's all set up, one touch and we're ready to go. That's what we do for our daily show here. Ryan's got the Pearl 2 in there. He's got um, the stream out to Twitch, to Facebook, and to YouTube, and a backup recording, a single backup recording, all at one touch, just push touch, and away we go, and everything's set and going. So that's pretty cool. Now, to reiterate the point of what we're actually recording here, we are at this point recording this YouTube and Twitch program. So we are recording it at this encoding settings. Whatever is set up in here, six megabit, that is what's being recorded. I also have a secondary recorder under here where I can record whatever I want. In fact, I can record all channels or just individual channels. This will record to a multi-channel video file. You can then take that multi-channel video file, extract the video files, and have multiple video streams from that. So what would you do with this? Let me show you. This, this feature right here, this one thing I'm about to show you, if you've done any streaming before, if you've done any switching before through hardware switching, software switching, whatever, done your live show, this one feature right here is going to blow you away and going to make you say, worth every stinking penny. Okay, ready for this? Let's go in here. I'm going to delete this Facebook mirror. See, I don't want to go to Facebook. We'll just, let's just forget this thing. Let's get rid of this guy. Don't want you. I'm going to set up a channel, a new channel. We're going to call this one Camera One. And on Camera One, I'm going to set a new item, a video source. Camera one we know is HDMI B because I got these backwards. Make sure my audio is enabled for that. Make that full size. Good. I'm going to save that. Save that. I'm going to go to my encoding and I'm going to set this full resolution, 1920 by 1080. I want a nice big fat file. So let's go for let's go for a 20 megabit file. And full quality audio apply. Saved. Bingo. Add channel. I'm going to repeat this whole thing. We're going to do this. We're going to go. Camera two, go down here, add new item, video source, camera two, which is HDMI A, because I'm backwards. I'm going to go ahead and record HDMI's audio separately, because I want that camera, that could be my computer, could be my iPad, whatever, I want that audio coming in. Save that, I'm gonna go back in, encoding, set a nice big fat 20 megabit, 20 megabit recording, and save that. Now, I go back to my recorder. What have I just done? I have just created 
a multi-track file that will record my mixed program, what was out on the air, plus an ISO of camera one and an ISO of camera two. You got that? We have just recorded three things simultaneously, two cameras and the ISO out. Now, you might be able to do even more than this. It is all dependent on the CPU load of the system. So it depends on what you're feeding it, how much scaling the system is having to do, um, what the other encoding bit rates are. Whenever you're doing anything on here, you will see a CPU load. As you get towards like 70, 80%, then you're kind of pushing things and you might start dropping frames and having other issues. So you may find that for your setup, maybe you can only record one plus the feed, or maybe you can do two ISOs plus the feed. Or if you're not streaming, maybe you can record all three as ISOs. If you want to record even more ISOs, you can go up to the Pearl 2 and it can handle it because it's got an even bigger processor in it. The point here is that you now have a recording of your live show plus your ISO so you could remix the show later. If you're doing, like I do the live show, sometimes I make a mistake on my, on my mix, I switch to the wrong thing, I'm talking to the camera and I realize, oh man, I never switched off, people have been looking at my desktop for the last five minutes while I was talking. That's your live show, there's nothing you can do about the live show, but if you recorded the sources separately, ISOs, isolated recordings of those, you can remix it later. This is huge. This is an enormous thing. And it all comes into a single file that within the software here, you extract them out and you just download individual tracks and then you can drop them into Final Cut or Premiere or whatever, set them up as a multicam edit and away you go. That is phenomenal. So that right there, worth the price of admission. Okay, that's recording. Uh, there's a channel set up, there's recording. Now let's go back down through these. The rest of these we don't have to spend a lot of time on. Our inputs we can search currently be used in camera two. It tells me where HDMI is being used right now. It tells me what it's getting, 1920 by 1080 at 24 megahertz. That's our 24p signal. It gives you a bunch of other information about it, the temperature of the box. And uh, if, there's a, if you're bringing in an interlay source, you can deinterlace it here. If you lose signal, you can choose what you want to go on screen. So by default, it's going to say no signal, but you could load up a custom graphic that says off the air or shows your, um, your title card, something like that. You can do that, right? So you can set all that up. Um, there's all kinds of other really advanced tech stuff in here we're not going to get into. And this shows you what that channel is currently seeing or what that um, input is currently seeing. So you've got your HDMI A, HDMI B. Oh, and by the way, you can rename these. So I can go in here to HDMI A and I can say, you know, that is my GH5. And we'll go to HDMI B, and let's say I plugged in my iPhone there, so that's my iPhone. So I can do all of that, rename them in here. There's my audio inputs and so on. When we get into audio, this is kind of neat. Is it stereo? This is the XLR input. Uh, do I need phantom power? I can supply that. I can change the gain on that, so if, I'm, if my levels are coming a little quiet, I can change that. And here's a really cool one, audio delay. I can actually re, I can resync my audio. So if I've got um, audio and video coming in at separate times, I can adjust that here. Why would that possibly happen? Why would you have them coming in separate times? It's gonna happen. Any camera with an HDMI output, the HDMI out is delayed by, uh, on a 24 frame timeline, about between three and four frames. Three and four frame delay between real time and what's actually coming out the HDMI port. You'll see this on any camera. Grab a Canon, grab a Nikon, grab anything. And when you look at what's coming out the HDMI port, it will be slightly delayed from real time. Okay. If I am getting my audio through the camera, right? If I'm talking into this mic, it's going through the camera, the camera is bringing them in sync and it's sending them out of here in sync together. So we don't have to worry about sync. However, if I have connected a microphone directly to the box or I've taken my audio mixer and I've fed it directly into the box, your audio mixer is giving audio out in real time. Meanwhile, your HDMI camera is giving it out a few frames late. Therefore, you go into here and you sync them up. You just pull them into sync. You adjust the timing until it's perfectly in sync. And the way that I would recommend that you do that is to start recording, have the camera on a clapper or something, even if you're just clapping your hands, but a clapper is good, or something that does a pop, like a single frame video and with a beep on it. And then you can just have that beeping, beeping, and then you can go in here and you can adjust it. And you could say, you know, I'm at whatever, minus 10 milliseconds, minus 20 milliseconds, minus 30 milliseconds, and just keep running through until you get it perfectly in sync, play back that recorded video, find the point where they line up perfectly, and then punch that number in and away you go. That's how that would work. But yeah, the fact that you can resync your audio in here, another phenomenal, phenomenal feature. Alrighty, um, output ports. We have an HDMI output in here. This is, as we saw in the, in the video, I'm um, in the close up here, it is somewhere in here. There it is, there's my audio output. Uh, sorry, my uh, HDMI output. That allows me to feed out to a confidence monitor or, so let's say, right, let's do a confidence monitor first. I'm doing my show. I wanna have a second screen or a big screen up here that shows me what the program is, what the audience is saying. It's just kind of a, 
like I said, it's confidence. I know that I've switched to the right source, or the switcher, whoever's, whoever's operating the switcher, knows that they've gone to the right source, so that's cool. But you can use it for other courses, other uh, situations as well. Let's say, this is a neat example. Let's say that I'm gonna do a live presentation for a small audience. I'm gonna go to a, a camera store or, I don't know, something like this. Camera store is a good example. I got a room of 20, 30, 40 people I'm gonna be talking to. All right, well, I've got, I've got my computer that I'm gonna be doing a demo from. I got some slides on here. And, um, and then there's me talking. Okay, this is standard presentation stuff. I wanna stream this thing live. Okay, that's cool. So I bring this with me and I take a camera along with me and I plug the camera into here. Camera's on me. And I take my laptop and I plug my laptop into here. So now I can or somebody else can, but I can do the switching. I can go back and forth so that the audience on the internet is gonna see me or the computer, or me or the computer. Now the audience that's in the room with me they got me in person. They don't need to see a video of me, but they do need to see my computer screen. So I can take an output from the Pearl Mini and plug that into a projector, big TV, whatever it is, and tell the HDMI out to only show my computer screen. So the actual audience in the room sees me in corporeal form and the video out from the Pearl, which is going to be just my computer. Meanwhile, those on the internet are seeing whatever is being switched to in here. So even I could do this, right? I could do the switching. So again, small room, small audience. I've got my laptop, I've got my Pearl, I've got a projector, and I am streaming the show out to the internet. I come back here and I go, okay, let's take a look at my computer screen. I hit this, blah, blah, blah. I start doing stuff on the demo. And then I'm gonna go walk around and talk to the audience for a bit. So I switch back to me and I go on and start walking around and talking to the audience. I come back, boom, back to the computer and do my demo. Pretty, pretty cool. That's just one of many uses. So the fact that you have the HDMI out that can be anything, it doesn't have to be what the program is, it can be any of the single sources, is pretty neat. So we'd set that up by going in here and saying source, um, so you can see all my different channels or individual inputs. So I can say, all right, show them just the camera, just the iPhone, just the SDI input, and away we go. That in itself is pretty slick. Uh, quickly, we're gonna go through the rest of these in here, and we're not gonna dive into these really deep, but you do have, this is a lovely feature, automatic file upload. So remember, we can record the program into here. We could then have that file automatically uploaded to, uh, uh, well, here, we'll take a look at what we can do. We have automatically uploaded to an FTP client, to an rsync client, CIF, SCP, SFF, we do FTP, um, AWS, that's Amazon Web Servers, you wanna push it up there, any web dev client, or copy it directly to an external USB drive. The example of that, which is I think is kinda of cool, is you're doing a program and you've got a client and you wanna be able to hand off a file to the client the instant you're done, but you wanna keep the file too. So I've got it recording to the internal SD card and recording simultaneously or being offloaded as soon as the show is done to a USB drive, pull that out, hand it over, and away we go. Before we run through the rest of these, let me see, I did see a couple question things come up here. So let me bring this up real quick and see here. Uh, just go back to the beginning of my name. There we go. Aaron says, looks like you can add graphic overlays and stuff per channel too then. Yes, that's correct. Like adding a corner bug only sent to Facebook but not to YouTube. Absolutely. Because your layouts can be different, you can 100% do that. Um, so yeah, you would, the way you would do that, in fact, let's just show that in here. Did I, um, well, I kind of deleted my other one. So I would go in and add a channel and let's do this. We'll call, we'll say add channel and we're going to call this Facebook watermarked and add a new layout. And I would take my video source of YouTube and Twitch. So there's that. And then I would add a picture. And you can, this supports PNG files. I don't have any on here, but it would support PNG files. So I could upload a PNG file. Remember, you do that through the media tab over here. Upload a PNG file with transparency and drop that on here and put it wherever I want. And now I've got that watermark. So yes, 100% you can do that. Very good question. Very cool. Um, Christian, Christian's asking, do you have to sync the external audio manually? Yes. So that's what we're doing in here. I think that question probably came up before I did that. But yes, you would do it manually because the system... I don't even see how the system would do that automatically. But yeah, you do that manually. So you go, okay, I've got my, this is assuming your video and audio are coming from different sources. I would go in and do that. And like I said, the way I would do it is by having a repeated beep happening and then just doing it. So this is how I would set it up. I would, set, I would take my iPad or another computer and play a video that has a beep on it, um, a beep and a flash. There's actually a YouTube video. You know, what? I will link to this down below. There's a YouTube video that I use regularly to check sync and it's a spinning handle, like a clock face, and it shows, there's a line that says in sync and then off by you know, a certain number of milliseconds, certain number of milliseconds, whatever, and it goes by and it goes beep when it hits here. If you film that screen and you see, if the hand is here when you hear the beep, 
then you know that you are X number of, of uh, frames or milliseconds out of sync, and it goes positive and negative. So I would point my camera at that screen and have the audio also recording. Well, it's obviously recording because it's picking that up. And then I would talk over it, and I would say, set it minus 10 milliseconds. Okay, now set it minus 20 milliseconds. Now set it minus 30 milliseconds. And just record that, and then play it back and figure out where it was uh, most you know closest, and then probably refine it from there because I can go down to you know the single millisecond. So I wanted to refine it from there. That's how I would go about doing it. Maybe there's a better way. If there is, tell me in the comments. But that's how I would do it. Alrighty, let's see here. Epifan says it's really pushing two ISOs and a program channel. We recommend using two video sources and up to two full HD channels simultaneously for best performance. Okay, so I went a little bit too far saying recording two programs and an ISO, two ISOs and a program might be pushing the limits. Uh, so two video sources. Okay, so I guess you're saying you can record two ISOs. So you record two ISOs and not the program out, perhaps, um, which makes sense as well. So you've got your ISOs recorded for later use, and the program out is what is being pushed out to the internet. That, that makes sense, too. And as I said, too, it, it is all processor dependent. So you can run your tests and see where your processors are and decide if you can afford to add more. And if you do find you need to add more to it, then, like I said, do the Perl, too. We'll take care of that for you. Um, negative delay. Is this a time machine? Yes, Aaron, it is. Uh, and Daniel says, great show. Why, thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to this, go through the rest of the settings on here. If you have any more questions, now's your last chance. Get them up on screen, and we will do those. All right, what else is on here worth looking at? So file upload, we just talked about your SD card. This is where you'd format your SD card. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't, wanna, I don't need that. Layout, uh, so SD card. So if you're going to format your card, nothing ex exciting there. External USB drive, there isn't one connected, but if there was, you could have it. Oh, there's a variety of things here. Use for, let me zoom into this. One-time copy or move of the recorded files, manually copy them over, automatically move, move the files via automatic file upload. So just different configuration depending on how, you're, um, how, you're, how you've got your whole thing set up. FTP server, so if you're doing FTP uploads, you just punch in all your FTP settings in there. Oh, UPnP, this is pretty cool. So you can actually broadcast a UPnP signal from here, meaning that if you have a UPnP-capable device on the same network, so smart TVs, um, I think some... Windows computers perhaps have this. There's a variety of devices that have UPnP capability. You could punch in the streaming address, and now you are basically broadcasting your video signal from here over your local network, and anything that can, that can read a UPnP signal will be able to see it. That's pretty neat. So imagine a huge office environment, huge office situation. You've got smart TVs all over the office. You've got multiple floors, thousands of employees. You could do a broadcast out to all of those TVs over the network that way. Pretty cool. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? Network settings is standard. This is the same stuff we saw on the front interface. You can configure it to use DHCP as it is now, or you can use a static IP address. This is also where you would set up for accessing the network via a tablet or a uh, USB modem. So you just go set it up for tethering, um, and I could say prefer, uh, prefer tethering, and then that way it is going to default to using the... the USB port, whatever got plugged into there. So if it's my phone, my iPhone plugged in, uh, my tablet plugged in, or just a dedicated USB LTE modem, that'll be plugged in there too. And network diagnostics, you can do that. All right, date and time. Obviously, as a date and time server, just to punch in your time zone. So it's an NTP time server, accesses that. Access passwords. So you can obviously lock out people from the full admin interface that I'm in now. You can do it based off of IP address. You can lock people in and out of it. Uh, add passwords to that. So, you know, full password protection, as you'd expect. Touchscreen, this is neat. What do you want the touchscreen to be able to do? I could, for example, say, uh, well, the display is enabled. I could say, do not allow network control. So no one can change the network settings who has access to the touchscreen interface. There's the uh, layout switching. Do I want people to be able to see this but not actually control the stream, switch layouts? I can change that here. So that's pretty cool. So I can control what that touch interface does. Um, single touch control, is that up there? Oh, the default, so the single touch control comes up automatically. You can change that. There's, you, know, you can have a pin on the touch screen. Neat stuff you can do on there. A serial port, so if you want to, over USB, you can connect a serial connection, and that allows you a whole other world of settings that we're not even going to get into right now. There's our media browser, uh, and then it's maintenance, backing up your files. Oh, this is really cool. So you can back up your settings, configuration presets. So I have one here called Photo Justice that I have already saved. I, if I hit apply right now, it's going to say, are you sure? It's going to reboot. I'm going to hit cancel on there. And it will load all of my settings. 
this allows me to have a show for, you know, let's say I, we, I do a weekly show for a client. I go into their location and I set this up and I do a show. I can save all those configuration presets and then I go to another client and I can save all their configuration settings. And I can even load those from here. So I can go back to the home screen, go into configuration presets and see there's my photo Joseph preset. If I tap on that, it says, uh, you know, warning reboot required. If I hit that, it's going to reboot this network right now, reboot this box with all of those settings in there. Um, this is also where you can get to a default setting. So right before the show started, this is what I did. I hit default, hit OK. It rebooted the device and it brought up just all the default settings. So you can save all those different settings for all your different clients, locations, whatever you got. So that's pretty cool. Uh, finally, in here, you have a firmware upgrade. So if you want to, uh, if you need to upgrade the firmware, check for updates. It'll tell you right there, no update required, no update available. So um, if there was, that would show up there. And, and the last one is just an info tab. Um, it'll give you a full status of everything that's happening right there including the CPU load. So the system load right now with all of these sources coming in is running at 42%. Uh, and then all, you also see a storage status on here, what's going on. Now I told you earlier that you can do all of the switching from your interface here, or you can do it on the computer. So if I go back here and I go to Epifan Live, click on that button, it opens up another admin interface. This is for monitoring, but the really cool one is you go to the switcher, and now I have access to the exact same switching interface that I had on the overhead device. So if I, I mean, on the device itself. So if I go back into here, uh, let's go back and load up YouTube and Twitch and bring up the switchers. So this control here, this interface here, is now being mirrored on the computer. So I can do all the switching here. This is access over network. So anybody who can connect it over the network can grab it and start switching. So that's kind of cool. So that doesn't have to be done here. So if you don't want to, um, it doesn't have to be done on here. So if you want somebody else to take over, they certainly can. <sighs> that's the basics. It's a lot, right? There's a lot of stuff going on in here. Uh, let me see what else is going on in the comments because I did see another question come by. And, oh, Sean is giving me grief. Sean, I'm going to ignore you. And that's what happens when your friends watch the show. Um, okay, I guess that's it. No other questions. Cool. Uh, oh, Christian's asking, how does it handle HDCP on an HDMI port? I believe it, uh, I mean, if it's protected, Epifan can answer that. Um, if it's protected, then you're not going to get it. So if you plug in a DVD player or something, it's not going to, you know, not, you're not going to be able to see that on there. Who watches DVDs anymore anyway? Okay. Whew. That was a lot. I hope that was interesting. Uh, was that Ryan? Oh, yes. Ryan's in my ear reminding me to ask a question. That is a very good thing. So I got to get better at this. Hey, audience, if you have any questions, you can put them down below. But I want to ask you a question. What question? I know what I'll ask you. What are you using for streaming right now? If you're doing a live show, what are you using to stream your live show today? Whether it's to YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, I don't care. But tell me what you're using. Are you using Wirecast? Are you using a Pearl? Are you using some other hardware or software configuration? Leave it in the comments down below. For those of you watching live, you don't have to put that in. You put it in the comments later. This is for the comments. Put that down in the comments below. I want to know what you guys are using. Yes, yeah, this whole like ask a question interaction on the channel. It's a good thing. Do me a solid. Ask a question. Hit that like button. I hope you enjoy this. I hope you learned something. We're not going to jump out to a separate Q&A today. We integrated that into the live show, which means I will see you at the next show, which will be in two days. Take care, everybody. I hope this is informational and educational, and I hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye.